Uh, this song we're going to sing is a woman's honored song. In my language, there is no word for art. This is not because we are devoid of art, but because art is so powerfully integrated with all aspects of life. We are replete with it. When the Europeans arrived, they found Aboriginal artists creating beauty, culture, and historical memory. As Aboriginal artists, we need to reclaim our own identities through our work our heritage and our future. My very earliest memories are really happy ones down by the river where the totem poles stood. I loved to go down there and just play around the huge sculptures that were there. And those totem poles tell our family histories. While I was young, I didn't think about that. All I knew was that I felt comfortable being there. Mom and Dad spoke to us all the time. My grandparents, my great-grandparents spoke very realistically about things. I could see in my mind's eye what they were talking about. And so I felt that I was surrounded by beauty. I felt that I was surrounded by by poetry and music and performance, choreography. These were described to us, but uh, they came alive. And when I actually started working on designing and on carving, it was really an exciting time for me. I would start painting something or carving something, and I would bring it home at night, and I'd stay up all night long. And it got so bad, I'd sometimes take my wood carving into the living room. I'd be sitting in one of our good front room chairs carving a mask because I didn't want to stop. My Gitsan name is Hachie. My English name was Doreen Harris originally, and then when I got married, I became Doreen Jensen. I was considered a great find in 1950 and 60s that I still remembered how to weave bulrushes. I was found weaving a basket that I had dug the roots and split and, and everybody said, oh, we have an expert here, an artist. I had never considered myself an artist. I was only doing what I was taught to do. But because no one else was doing what I was doing, I was called an artist. To this day, I don't think of myself as an artist. I just think of myself as being obedient to the teaching of my elders. And I'm passing on my teachings to the next generation. I am Hualikuya from the Stalo Nation in the Fraser Valley. I am the head woman of the Wolf Tribe from Sumas. The rest of the world knows me as Rena Point Bolton. People pretty well had to identify to me in art school what art was because I came into the courses and I didn't know what a 2B pencil was. I had no idea what they wanted. I just thought, well, draw, that means making marks with pencils. And I was quite surprised when I even got a B plus for this first thing I drew in art school. I picked art also because I could be involved in that physical expression of making imagery, but also because it was the only alternative for me in other ways, too. 
it was a discipline that crossed boundaries, and there were clearly boundaries for Native people when I was going to school. It was also a discipline that you could go into science, you could go into uh, music, you could go into theater. I mean, they wouldn't say to you, you're not a scientist, so you can't draw anything about the universe. So when I'm talking to kids, I always say to them, I was an astronaut last week, and they all start laughing. And that's when I'm doing my blue medicine wheel paintings or nebula paintings, and it's like I'm in outer space looking back. My name is Joan Cardinal Schubert, and I play a lot. Some of the first images I remember as a child are mostly from nature. I guess that's what, what it would be for every child. And you remember the sky. I remember looking at the sky and the clouds a lot, that awesomeness, and you see all, and then they would move, and you'd see animals. And then you'd see people, and then you'd see a whole movie. My painter's name is Jane Ashpatra, and my mother's name was Patra. That was the name that Indian Affairs gave her when she was born. My Indian name is uh, Chilla Luisia, so I've added that now, and so now I call myself Jane Ashpatra Chilla Luisia. Art can be a universal language that helps us build the gaps between our different cultures, but attitudes toward art reveal racism. The first Europeans called our art primitive and vulgar. Today, people of European origin call our art craft and artifact. The single worst thing that happened was that Academics tended to freeze our art into a certain time period. We need to be able to communicate what it is that we're doing. We need to do it in our own words, in our own voices, because up until now, our work has been defined by outsiders, and uh, it's difficult for an outsider to, to define the art that I'm making or that other people are making, unless they're part of that. Everything that I learned to make were of use to the people. The baskets were used for cooking, for uh, carrying water, for picking berries. The open weave were used for washing fish heads, for washing clams, for washing seaweed. The blankets were used for ceremonies and, and for bedding. The mats were used for mattresses, uh, the bulrush mats. The cedar bark mats were used for ceremonies where you stood on them when you received a name. Uh, this was an honor to stand on the mat of an elder who wove this with her hands. They were very special people in the village these canoe carvers or house builders, basket weavers, blanket weavers, uh, they were treated with great respect. The people looked upon artists as almost holy. They were revered. And if they didn't have imaginations, they wouldn't uh, hold a position like that. They had to be unique, you know. When I started painting, I thought, well, I'm not going to take this lightly. You know, I'm, I'm not going to just paint flowers. I started to go back historically and look into my family background, and I thought, well, where do these people come from? And I wanted to go back to the earliest knowledge of that, and so that's when I went to look at the pictographs on the um, Milk River. As soon as I went there, it was just incredible, like it was all around me, this kind of power thing. And 
I thought, this is incredible. I mean, these, these wonderful drawings. And as a printmaker, I had done a lot of incising on metal. And I know how difficult it is to make a curvilinear line. So on those cliff faces, I saw these incredible circles and curvilinear lines by taking a sharp object, you know, and going into the rock. And I know it's very difficult to do. So you knew that the person who did those were skilled. And so I thought, this is an artist. I can learn from this. So I started drawing these pictographs. So it always takes a long time for me to um, gather information, and it's almost like I get to the point where I'm charged up and it has all gelled together, and then I express it. So a lot of the pictograph paintings didn't really happen until the late 70s. I came down to the southwest here because I have a show at the Elaine Horwich Gallery. Elaine asked me to do a show here in October. And I was here in earlier in the spring. It was really a chance for me to come back to one of the most sacred places to my heart. As the title says, it's like the shaman's ride. So in this particular exhibition, it's going to take you on a ride through a shaman's journey, through his teachings. So this is the entry piece to the show, that you are going on the back of the horse with the shaman, and he explains his world to you. And it sort of goes with a whole series of those. That's why it should be in, because it's a real complete set when you hang them all together. They look, okay. It has a story to tell. Uh, we, have, we have a shaman's ride. Now, we could put shaman's ride on that wall, because oh, that's that the cover nice piece. Too. Yeah, that would and be And that nice. would give it prominent position. Yeah. Well, should we start moving some work around? Let's do it. We could go canvas, canvas, and then these nice, long, narrow pieces. When I was about 20, by this time I was married and had two children. So I joined this uh, museum committee in Hazleton. And we were trying to find a name for the building, the museum, <clears throat> to house the artifacts that uh, we were able to keep in our community, because most of them were going out of the country. And uh, this uh, very wise man said, uh, you, can't, you can't call it a museum. He said, museums are a place where you keep objects of a, of a dead culture. He said, our culture is not dead, it's only sleeping. And I thought, wow. I, I just uh, was so, it just really got me right here, you know, and I thought, I've got to be part of that reawakening of our culture. And that was in 1958, and I have been working steadily on that reawakening of the culture and just trying to bring better awareness. I just knew that what we needed was a voice, because everywhere I looked, looked in the literature, I looked in museums, our artifacts were there, but our voice was never there. My children were growing up and uh, going their own way, and so I got involved in uh, Indian politics. I did this very rebelliously because I knew it was against the law for us to do this sort of thing. We were not allowed to. It was in the Indian Act that we would never participate in any kind of functions, uh, wearing Indian garments or anything to do with pot latching. But I wanted to prove that it wasn't wrong. So very openly, I made Indian skirts out of cedar bark and capes, and I dressed my children, and we performed. And because I did this, uh, a lot of political people saw me do this. They were there watching the festival. So I was asked then to take part in the cultural revival of our people. So I did this.
When I was back home last fall, it was really exciting for me, seeing the totems out at Kispiox again, seeing the mountains, and, and then going into Hazelton, visiting Kassan Village, where I was involved in the development of the art classes, the weaving classes, the jewelry classes. But I was excited to see that the Ginmax School of Art, Northwest Coast Indian Art, is now housed in a nice, comfortable room. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. And it just made me remember when I took my course, it was the very first course in Northwest Coast Indian Art that was taught at Kassan. And this building just had upright boards. So in the winter time, as I sat there carving, I would have a drift of snow right across my lap. More and more, I'm wanting to spend more time on my art. And I get excited about doing the few things that I do do. And sometimes I think about it because other people who I started out with have been working full time at the art. Sometimes I, I envy them. My brother Walter actually didn't start carving until after I did. There are many artists who I would like to spend time with just discussing this art making. I'd like to hear how it feels when they're doing their art and why they do their art. Their work inspires me. Well, the first thing I learned was discipline. Uh, I was made to sit certain lengths of time while my grandmother told me stories. I was allowed to help her uh, to tease wool that she was working on. But learning to sit for great lengths of time and keeping my fingers busy was the hardest for me. But as I grew older, it became easier. I was not allowed to play with other children until I learned obedience. And then uh, I learned to spin wool on my knee with the spindle whirl that we call swulchul. And then I learned to weave on the loom and to knit uh, sweaters. The first group of baskets I remember I finished with a mat. I uh, brought down to the uh, Arts and Crafts Society and I went down there and sold them. A and uh, I felt like a traitor, you know. I, I went, after they uh, wrote out the check and gave it to me, I went and sat in the car and I was sitting there alone and I started to weep, you know. And I felt as if I had sold my elders down the river you know, because here they had given me this beautiful art and I was selling it. I felt so guilty. I sat there and uh, I was crying away and my husband came and he looks at me and he said, what's wrong, dear, you know, and I told him, well, I don't feel right about selling those baskets. And he told me, well, in the old days, you would have been taken care of. People would have made sure that you had a good place to stay and food. But today, it's not like that. You have to sell them in order to, to uh, make a living, if this is what you're going to do for a living. Once I decided that it was OK to be in school, there were still times that the teacher's world and my world would collide. Uh, she decided that uh, for art, I should learn how to uh, make stick figures. And that just didn't look right to me. And I did try. I really tried to, to do the stick figures exactly the way she wanted, skipping stick figures. 
And I thought, this is so stupid. I don't want to be doing this. Those stick figures seemed very unnatural to me. I thought about the forms that were on the totems. So I really knew what figures should look like. And it wasn't those stick people. So I put up my hand and asked to be excused. And what I did was I ran all the way home. Mom wasn't really surprised when I came home. And she was so supportive, I was quite surprised. I, in fact, expected that she would reprimand me. So it was okay then, uh, and I did go back, and I did master those little stick figures. But I did go on to do things that looked more real to me. There happened to be uh, an artist going through town, so I was introduced to oil painting at that time. I took a two-year course. The first year was studying the design elements of Northwest Coast Indian art, and we just spent days just learning how to make ovoids, U-shapes, and paint it. Then the second year, we actually did three-dimensional carving. Before all of that, we had to learn to make our own tools. And this was the very first tool that I ever made. It's made of, of good steel. And, well, it was just a piece of steel. And I had to shape it into the shape that I wanted. To this day, this has been really faithful to me. It just uh, holds a really nice edge. I can sharpen it and works really well. We studied voice, drama, studied movement, storytelling, choreography. We learned how to dramatize legends by about 20 of the old masters of the Gitxan. I sort of have about four mediums that I work in, installation, larger paintings, which may or may not be uh, stretched on a canvas, smaller paperworks, and collage. And so, in a funny way, I'm, I have a sense of humor about the whole art history process. I'm kind of playing on Western European art history and then introducing aspects of my culture into it so that uh, it has a meeting ground for people understanding. And I use text to further explain that, because I don't want to alienate anybody. It's multidimensional in, in technique and also in philosophy and uh, visual imagery. The name of the installation at the A Space Gallery is Dead River Scrolls. It's a multimedia piece. And it was really about the situation with the Old Man River and the dam that's being built on it. The bottles were like a symbol for the dam, visual symbol, which became three-dimensional. I was really talking about, you know, how old this planet is we live on and how it continues to go even though we're not here anymore. But while we're here, we should at least try to behave responsibly and, and think about people.
The lesson takes them through the beginning of what happened when Native people met the non-Native people that came to this country and takes them right through the history of what has happened. I realize that what Native people need is to be deprogrammed. This is a new kind of fact for Native people. It's a new truth. This is my history. In the beginning, there were Native peoples across the land. When new people came, they shared with them their knowledge and goods, and the new people took what they wanted. There were different rules, laws. After I did this performance piece in Toronto, I was confronted by five or six of the people that were in the performance, and their eyes were full of tears, and they had their hands over their heart on their chest, and they were telling me, almost in unison, how wonderful that felt, how great they felt. And at that point, I realized that as Native people, we really need to be deprogrammed because we have accepted some things as being truths, and they're buried long, long ago in our childhood, and they affect the way that we operate today. True to a hundred-year-old tradition was artist, Morrisot, Stump, Oje, Reed, Martin, John B., who gave my people their spirits back. When I was a child, you know, I really liked that gluing on of stuff, too. And, and I've always had this affinity, this love for pasting and ripping and, and adding paint on top and drawing back into it. We used to be brownies and go down to Sacred Heart Church. And my little girlfriends and I would always fly up to the rectory and hang out with the priests, Father Reynolds and Father Klug. And, the other priests, and they would be at their desks doing their work. And they wanted to get their work done, but they were so polite, they weren't going to say, well, you little girls, go on home, go on home. Go bake cookies or something. So Father Reynolds, in his brilliant moment, just took out all these catalogs, these old Sears and Woodward's catalog, gave us scissors, gave us glue and pieces of paper. And we would spend Saturday afternoons in a rectory gluing and making these pieces of work of art. And it was the most enjoyable, engrossing time. And that's when I started this whole collage thing. Yeah. So do you like these stars? It's very strange. It's like I felt for many years that I was an alien. And that who was I? Because my mother passed away, you know, when I was six years old. And they didn't tell me. And I was sort of taken out of my nice rural setting and plunked into the middle of this urban chaos and lost and people talking a language I didn't understand. I was really, really s confused and I was very, very quiet. Well, I um, went into a science degree at first. I worked a few years in the field. I was a microbiologist. And I enjoyed it, I taught, and out of a lot of pain, I actually started doing art in the evening again, and I had a girlfriend, and she said to me, you should come and um, take some courses at the university in the evening, some painting courses. I thought, well, maybe I should take a few years of Bachelor of Fine Arts, because this is really fun. <laughs> and, you know, go to school, postpone being um, a professional, and have a few more fun, a few more years playing at it. And I'm still playing. And now, when I paint, I just do it. I say, well, this is what's right because it feels good and it's a euphoric expression and it's what I, it's what, I, I, I don't think paint in sort of like a conscious mode. I paint in another mode mm -hmm. uh, where you get really carried away and then I stand back and look at it and go, hmm. Then I do maybe a few little things to correct it, right? And then that's it, it's done. So this one's talking about the Stone People's Lodge, we call it, that's really the proper term for it because you bring in hot stones in the middle of the sweat lodge and you pour healing water from the river that creates a steam inside and that's the, uh, it makes you sweat out the poison in your system and then the, the shaman will go in and, and fix the lodge up and make it pure again to bring in the good spirits. Um, 
in this particular one, I put the sage on the willow balls that they used to make the sweat lodge. And this one is just the frame now. Here you have an actual picture of a man sitting inside after probably sweating. And they're probably just, maybe between rounds, maybe it's after. Here you see the They're very old, small. Yes, they are very small. They're not very big, and, but you can crowd a lot of people in there, I tell you. Okay. Native Americans down here, they have different ceremonies than what we have up north. We have the pipe and we have the sweat lodge. Their sweat lodge ceremonies are a little bit different. And they also have the uh, Native American church meetings, the uh, peyote ceremony. And they asked me to partake in that ceremony, and I did. I've incorporated that in a show that I did down here. There's a lot of references to Father Peyote, to the altar, to their way of worship. And there's references also made to our way of worship, the sun dances, the sweat lodge, the prayer ties. And in that way, it was like bridging the north to the south. I thought I knew who I was until I left home. And then when I started getting out in a world where I wasn't protected all the time and I didn't know all the people, people seemed to know more about me than I knew. So I thought, this is strange. Um, and I would answer questions once in a while, you know, and about my background, whatever, and I, I wasn't offended by them. But they still made me kind of feel uncomfortable and I was always on edge waiting for the big question, right? And when finally I went into university and I was taking a printmaking course, uh, uh, this woman came walking across the room that I hadn't met. I'd seen her in the class. <clears throat> she had a zinc plate in her hand, and as she was walking by me, I was going to the acid bath, and she was coming from it. She just looked at me, like face to face, and said, what tribe are you from? I thought, my goodness, you know, I haven't even met this woman formally, and she wants to know all about my life. But that just went split second through my mind, and I looked at her because I knew that she really wanted me to just feel really uncomfortable. I looked her straight in the eye, and I said, blood. And after that point, you know, I was 30 years old. I thought, that was so easy. You know, <clears throat> so and I learned from that. I learned a lesson from that is that, you know, if you're going to let people control you and control your emotions, you know, it, it's a losing game, so you might as well just be up front with it. My father built things. He was in construction, and I watched him from the time I was a little kid, and I built things as a result of it. When I wanted to talk about what my family had built and what I had built as being part of that family with my life, I made a booth which would require people to look in at intimate aspects of my life and while they're looking in they are deconstructing because they're criticizing but while they're looking in i make it very difficult for them to do that they have to look through a clear window or a half red or a clear window or a red window which means that they're deciding where i fit in the whole native spectrum because there is a spectrum it's always decided by someone else who you are because they're looking at you and they have this idea. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna just point out what you're doing when you're deconstructing. That piece is actually called Preservation of the Species, Deconstruct This, this is the house that Joe built. On the side of the booth, I have two peep poles on either side and one is way too high and one is way too low. And I see people, you know, and they're standing on their toes and they're straining their necks and or they're bending down and killing their backs. It makes me feel good, you know, because they feel uncomfortable, but I felt that way all my life dealing with their deconstructing. So I'm kind of, just for a brief moment, giving them a picture of how I feel. The other thing is that when you walk in the room, there's stuff happening on the left, stuff happening on the right. And what it does, it kind of boggles your peripheral vision all the time, keeps you tense. And that's what the lettering and the writing is about in the wall, too. I don't think people feel very comfortable in that room. 
But because it's writing on a blackboard, they feel obligated to stand there in most cases because we've all been trained. So I, I write it from the point of what I consider to be history of Native people and more particularly my, my information about that, my experience as a Native person. We need to put aside titles that have been imposed on our creativity, titles that serve the needs of others. Our art is situated in the realm of anthropology by a discourse that validates white artists. Today, there are many art forms of the First Nations which are still not being recognized. Just think of the exquisite seagrass baskets from the west coast of Vancouver Island the quill work, and the moose hair tufting arts of the people east of the Rockies, and ceremonial robes woven in applique throughout North America. Not surprisingly, these exquisite works of art are mainly done by women. When it came to women's art, it just wasn't recorded by the academics or by the explorers or whoever was out there recording these things. They didn't record women's work. Also the fact that uh, the robes were made of uh, trade goods uh, almost disqualified them as being uh, even a good artifact. I created my, my own ceremonial robe. Well, there are certain guidelines you have to follow when you're doing something for ceremonial use. It's a different kind of excitement. It feels much more critical. I was really honored when Ron George asked me if I would design his vest for him. But at the same time, I was really frightened because it was going to be for a ceremonial purpose and for a very public person to be wearing it. And so I was very concerned. I talked to my mom and I explained to her that I was concerned about it because it was for ceremonial use. And, and she said, don't worry about it, just do it. So anyway, I worked on it and I finally got it done. But before I went to Ron, I, I went to my mom's. It was just so exciting when mom looked at it and she said it was beautiful and then she goes, oh! She says, that wolf is really alive. You know, it becomes alive for them. She was so happy. She said, it's beautiful. She said, it just, it's perfect. And you tell Ron George that it's very, very important that he wear it every time he's doing something important. So every time I see Ron wearing his vest, I think about my mother's words. I remember a story that uh, I heard from uh, a leader, one of our great leaders here in the north, when he saw me weaving a basket. He cried and he said, uh, when I was a little boy, he said, we used to have to take a boat uh, and uh, uh, go to Vancouver. Uh, we were so poor, uh, and we'd go to um, the hop fields to earn a living. Before we went to the hop camps, he said, uh, my grandmother used to sit on, on the corner of Hastings and Maine, uh, and she would weave baskets for money that they needed you know, right now. And she would weave cedar bark baskets and sell them for probably two dollars or a dollar, whatever she could get for them. He says, if it wasn't for my grandmother, we probably wouldn't have eaten because she kept working so hard with her baskets. Now this happened all over the place. Uh, the women had to continue on with some of the crafts to put food on the table, whatever the uh, European people would buy from them, took a fancy to. 
So it's safe to say, I guess, that the women were the ones who kept our, our crafts alive during those years when we were not supposed to be doing them at all, when the potlatch was banned. It included anything that was made by Native people. I see the artist as a giver, but also as a healer, especially in today's society. And in earlier times, they were probably healers too. The courage for me, I believe, comes from the great creator. I do the best I can. I pray. And I believe in those prayers. That's where I believe that courage comes from. You can think, here they are giving you an image or giving you a dance or giving you a poem or giving you the giving of themselves. And what they have to do is reach really down inside and to bring out this truth on canvas or this truth in poetry when it has the passion and the believability is when you know in itself that they themselves have been through it or have got identified or have seen it through their eyes they're not seeing it through other person's eyes i tend to work sort of more in a, a circle with a lot of little circles spinning off from it and every once in a while, I go back in that circle and take off on one of those little tangents I've already sort of explored. And I find that as I get more experience, I go back and I re-explore them because I have more ideas I can add to them. It's like a continuum. We've been talking about a continuum, and that's what it is. It's interesting that, you know, art reflects life and life reflects art because that's exactly what's happened. I learned that from my grandparents, my parents, that there was this continuum and when you look back on it, it was all referenced. So in, in my art, there is this continuum as well. This is the coiled weaving that I learned to do from my paternal grandmother. There is no wood in it. And these were watertight. They used to cook in them in the old days. They would, uh, if there, there was a leakage, they would patch them with pitch. And uh, then they would heat rocks, little small rocks, and drop them in. And they would make a soup or a stew, uh, whatever. But it, it was possible to cook in them in the old days. When I was president of the Indian Arts and Crafts Society years ago uh, with the homemakers, I traveled to the north and I was so anxious to see their baskets, but they didn't have any, there wasn't any left. And uh, so after a few years, I moved to the north and um, I was interested in their basket weaving. So I did research on it for 15 years. And then I developed the old Simpson type weaving. This is uh, spruce root uh, with the, the black cedar bark uh, as a design on here, uh, the black trim you see here. And this is just uh, spruce root that has been dyed a darker brown. This is what they call an open weave. Uh, and um, it's a twined, a fine twined weaving. It's a trinket basket. This, is, this type here is all cedar bark, and it's a, a really fine, fine twined weave. This is also Simpsian, and it took me years and years to uh, learn to do this type of weave. But now I've perfected it, and I'm teaching it to other people in the north. Uh, some of my grandchildren are part Simpsian, so I'm teaching it to them too. So uh, this time around, I'm making sure it's not going to die out again. The teachings were not for me to become an artist. They were for me to carry the teachings to the next generation. 
It's like a flow uh, of energy. I receive my strength by going to the woods and digging the roots, splitting them and weaving them into beautiful baskets so that the world may see what nature has to offer if you will but look for it. Okay. Anything that I use, whether it's a dye or a fiber, it comes from the earth. And by my continuance of using these things from the forest or the woods, it keeps me in touch with Mother Earth. I always thank the earth and the atmosphere for that grew these things. This is also part of our teaching. And then the next round you will leave you will leave this one behind and start from here. Oh, okay. So you see you're starting already to do your oh, the mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is the easy way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then you that's it. You don't do this last one. Oh, you leave that okay. too. I see you've learned the technique uh, quite well, Wendy. You're doing the um, the twined weave mm -hmm. on cedar bark. That's, that's really uh, excellent. You've improved a lot on your weaving technique since I was here last. I think it's really good. Okay. And the uh, Paula Marie is um, pounding cedar bark. After she's through pounding it, she'll ruffle it until it's nice and soft. Then it can be made into anything, uh, a skirt or a shawl. to learn from the wisdom of our ancestors. We need to recognize the hard work of our predecessors, which has brought us to where we are today. Canada is an image that hasn't emerged yet because this country hasn't recognized its First Nations. Its whole foundation is shaky. If Canada is to emerge as a nation with cultural identity and purpose, we have to accept First Nations art and what it has to tell us about the spirit and the land. If you really pay attention, you can get the message and make it your own without diminishing it or appropriating it. quite a job raising 10 children. Everything I know uh, has to be carried on. And if not one can carry it on, then surely all of them together will be able to carry on. Ha 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 
Sweet, wild, cause I'm sweet, each